Aristotle once said that gold was water solidified in the ground and mixed with the sun's rays. Others were sure that gold was made with the help of the philosopher's stone. When the ancient Incas first saw gold, they decided that this metal, falling from the sky, was the tears of a mythical creature. But its real origin seems much more epic. Let's go to a very distant past, to the time when there were no people or animals, to the time when dinosaurs didn't exist yet, to the era when the simplest forms of life were just being formed. Our planet resembled a huge cauldron of chemical elements. There were erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and lightning flashes all the time. It was about 3.9 billion years ago. During this period, huge asteroids flew through our solar system. They fell on Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's possible that asteroids also fell on the moon and left large craters on it. There was a real apocalypse on our planet. But fortunately, no one felt it because there was no life yet. Along with the destruction, the asteroids brought metals. But were there metals on Earth before that? Of course. The core of our planet is mainly made up of metals such as iron. From there, it spreads to Earth's crust, mixes with magma, comes into contact with oxygen, and combines with other elements. But how did they get into the core? Simple hydrogen and helium atoms merged and formed heavier elements inside giant stars. Then, supernovae exploded and formed big clouds of dust and gas. These clouds reached our galaxy and began to revolve around the sun. Over time, this dust and the remnants of stars formed planets. One of them was our Earth. Metals lying in the bowels of our planet are difficult to get. And we wouldn't have the technology we have now if it wasn't for that meteor shower that left metals on Earth's surface. There are two theories. The first suggests that powerful supernova explosions far from our universe formed a lot of metals from the periodic table. During the explosion, nuclear fusion started and it created atoms of gold. Then the blast wave threw those hot pieces in different directions. They flew for a long time, cooled down in cold space, and reached our solar system. Another theory says that gold and other metals appeared because of the merger of two neutron stars. These are powerful giant stars that are many times smaller in size than the sun, but several times heavier than it. These are objects with tremendous gravitational force and density. Their collision formed an intense gamma ray burst of radiation that could synthesize gold. In 2017, astrophysicists observed the collision of two neutron stars for the first time. They found traces of heavy metals, including gold, using gravitational wave detectors. So this theory seems more likely. And what if we go even further? Where did stars come from? Clouds of dust and gas are scattered throughout the universe. They mix, combine into one mass, and grow like a snowball. They squeeze each other and form a gravitational force. When all the material collapses, it starts to heat up. And then, this surge of energy creates a star. Some physicists assume that stars, during their lifetime, can produce most of the elements of the periodic table. If this theory is true, then our body also consists of stars. We may be part of some gigantic supernova that exploded billions of years ago at the other end of the universe. More than 50 years have passed since the appearance of this theory, but no one has proved or disproved it. Okay, let's get back to gold. One of the largest gold deposits in the world is in Southern Africa. Scientists believe that the precious metal appeared there more than two billion years ago after the fall of a giant meteorite. People are sure that gold is hidden in the world's oceans. Anywhere from 10 to 20 million tons of this precious metal can be underwater. But those are not large stones, but tiny particles dissolved in liquid. The extraction of such gold is too expensive. Now, let's find out how people mine gold and turn it into jewelry. At first, 
people find gold deposits, large plots of land or rock inside which gold is hidden. Workers begin to use picks, shovels, and machines to extract shiny pieces from the rock. Then these pieces are dissolved in a special acid that separates the gold from the solids. After that, other substances get removed from the precious metal by melting or using gaseous flora. When the gold is purified, it's checked for purity. 99.9% .9 is the benchmark. Done! Your gold is ready to use. You can turn it into jewelry or part of an electronic device. The rarest metals on Earth also got here from stars. I'm talking about rhodium and iridium. They are several times more expensive than gold, not because of their beauty, but because of their practical value. For example, rhodium and iridium can turn harmful gases into harmless ones, and 90% of the demand for this metal falls on the automaker's market. People use these metals in the manufacturing of auto catalysts. They are needed to clean harmful exhaust. When toxic substances produced during fuel combustion come into contact with these precious metals, they become their safer forms. A micro layer of rhodium and iridium is applied to the walls of the catalyst cylinder. Gold, platinum, rhodium, and iridium are the most expensive metals. But what about the most durable ones? It's a little complicated to determine one winner because the strength of a metal depends on four criteria. First, there's tensile strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist tearing. For example, modeling clay has a low tensile strength because you can easily stretch it in different directions. Among metals, tungsten is perhaps the most difficult to stretch. Another criterion is compressive strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist compression. And here, chrome is one of the strongest. The third criterion for the strength of metals is yield strength. To test this, you need to make a rod or beam from any metal and then try to bend it and break it. The metal that shows the greatest resistance has a high yield strength level. And titanium is pretty good for that. And the fourth criterion is impact strength. This shows how strong the metal is when it gets dropped or hit. In this regard, iron shows a good result. Each metal has its own strong and weak sides. Chrome, for example, has a high resistance to compression, but it's weak if you try to stretch it. Therefore, people make metal alloys to combine their strengths. Okay, we've learned about the rarest and most expensive metals. And what about other elements? What's the rarest substance in the world? Meet astatine, the rarest element on the planet. There are about 0.8 ounces of this substance found in the whole world. The rate of its decay is equal to the speed of its formation. Therefore, the amount of the substance in nature doesn't change. People discussed it in the 1800s and discovered it at the end of the 19th century. But even now, after so many years, we know little about this element. In 1869, the creator of the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev, learned that there was a certain substance numbered 85 in the group of halogen elements. This group of non-metals includes such substances as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So astatine is considered the heaviest of all known halogens and most similar to metals. It has a low melting point and conducts heat and electricity poorly. It's brittle in solid form and has a dark color. Even today, scientists don't know all its properties. It's almost impossible to find it in nature, but chemists have learned to synthesize it artificially. People don't know how to use this element because it's too radioactive. But in some laboratories, scientists conduct experiments using astacine to treat thyroid diseases. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.